Now, if, you, uh, if you've been coming here for a while recently, we've been doing a series on the um, Christian cults, right? So-called Christian cults. So we went over Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, Seventh-day Adventist, and then last week I hit on the, uh, the Potter's House up here. That is, um, you know, I said they weren't a f they're not necessarily a full-blown cult like those other ones. They don't have someone, you know, there, there's, some, there's a lot of attributes they don't have. But there's a lot of very cult-like attributes that they do have. You know, the, one of the things I didn't even mention before is just kind of their reliance on the pastor. It seems like almost everyone I talk to, they have varying levels of, of Bible knowledge, which that's to be expected of any church, is, you know, varying levels. But they all seem to have this, just this, well, my, the pastor just, you know, like just completely relying on what he says, which you got to be careful with that. And no matter what church you're in, of being able to rely on your understanding of Scripture and that you know what the Bible says and why the Bible says it and, and know what you believe instead of just relying on a man. When you start relying on a man, that's when it becomes cult-like. But there's so many other things. I'm not going to re-preach that sermon, all the various things that they do that, that is why I even preached that they're cult-like. But with many of the other sermons, I pulled out one doctrine and gave a, dedicated an entire sermon to it. So like with the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, not believing in hell. I preached an entire sermon on the reality of hell and how it's a real place. It's not just annihilation. You know, and, and there's been other sermons too where I just pulled out one thing that's a core belief of what they believe. And tonight, what I'm going to be preaching on, and another reason why that they're not Christian, I don't want to even be lumped in the same group as that church and what, how damning they are and how damaging it is. And you know, I preach an entire sermon that says that Potter's House preaches a false gospel. And I say that they're, they're literally doing the work of Satan. And it's evidenced because one of the things that they believe in is this tongue speaking thing. And when I say tongue speaking, it's the, the Pentecostal, you know, gibberish going to have and just, and just, whatever coming out of your mouth that they don't know what it is. Nobody knows what it is. I don't care if you claim to have some interpreter. They're making it up. The so-called interpreters, when they hear this stuff, they want to look spiritual. They know no one else understands what they're saying. So they just want to stand up and say, he's saying this and he's saying that. And it's nonsense. And you know what? It's literally of the devil. So what we're going to do tonight is, and this isn't just for that church, it's for all Pentecostal churches, anyone who believes in this nonsense and this witchcraft and the demon possession of the speaking in tongues. Because you know what? There's two different types of people. There's those that fake it because they want to look spiritual, because that's what other people are doing. And I believe that's probably the majority of people. The majority is probably just faking it. I mean, you go to church for a while and you don't want to feel left out and everybody around you is speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. And you got people telling you it's a sign of you being saved. If you're not speaking in tongues, you're not saved and all this other nonsense. So under that type of, you know, weight or, or, or you know, people are looking at you, you're going to start just doing the same thing. Well, this is what I need to do. And you make it up. And I, I mean, I've talked to people who sincerely are like, man, I just wanted to speak in tongues. And like, they literally spend like hours like at home and doing, you know, and like reading the Bible and doing things and like just trying to like get to themselves to a point. And it's like they're psyching themselves up to do this. Like, well, wait a minute. Why should you even have to psych yourself up to speak in tongues anyways? Why, you know, like, well, is it the Holy Spirit or not? You know what I mean? You know what I mean? But um, what I'm going to do, and anyone who's seen this or been around this will know that's not true. Well, you know, that, that what happens, what you see in these Pentecostal churches is actually described in Scripture, but it's not the Holy Spirit. Think about what you see when people are in these crazy Pentecostal churches where there's people running up and down the aisles and there's people shaking their heads and they're going, oh, you know, and they're falling on the ground and they're flopping around and people are just saying weird, you know. They think, they get all excited and they think it's the Holy Ghost. But we started off in Matthew 17. Look at verse number 14. Let's just see something that's probably similar to this. Because these people, when they say that they're being, you know, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit is just filling them, they don't have control over what they're doing. 
Most people who are not faking it, you know what they're going to tell you? I don't even know what, like, everything that happened. And, like, other people have to tell them what they did. Yeah. It's like a blackout experience. Yeah. I, didn't, I don't even know what I was doing. Yeah. And those are the ones that, are, that I believe is real. Yeah. Not just the ones who are just faking it, put on a show, trying to look like everyone else or whatever. Look at Matthew 17, verse 14. The Bible says, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic. And sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. So he's fallen down, he's going in, he's you know, falling into the water, falling into the fire. Obviously not under his own control. Mm -hmm. So what happens? And I brought him to the disciples, they could not cure him. And Jesus said to him, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. The child was cured from that very hour. So one of the attributes you see of someone who's possessed by the devil is they're falling down, right? falling into the water, falling into the fire, you know, things that would hurt him. Yeah. Now, you, you say, yeah, but I, don't, I go to these churches. I don't see him falling in water. And fall. It's because it's not around him. But you see him falling to the ground. You see him falling in the aisles. I mean, that's what's happening. Or they're trying to come up to the pulpit and the guy's going, <laughs> slapping them on the forehead and they're falling down on the ground, right? I mean, it, this is the, it's, it's nonsense. But when, when we see, look, we're trying to get biblical examples because where, where in Acts chapter 2 do you see people rolling around on the ground? Mm -hmm. And Peter preached a sermon and everyone started rolling on the ground and laughing and he was slapping people on their foreheads. I mean, where do you come up with this stuff? It's not, not from the Bible, I'll tell you that much. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter, we're, we're gonna, we're, what we're doing, I'm going through a few examples of people who are possessed with devils and, and how the Bible describes a person who's possessed with a devil. A devil, a bad spirit, you know, whatever you want to call it. There's, there's a few different ways that the, the Bible refers to someone who's possessed, but we're going to see the attributes. We're going to see what actually happens and say, and consider what does that look like? What does the, the Pentecostal tongue-speaking movement look like more? Something out of that, that uh, you know, a, a born-again preacher, the Apostle Paul or Peter or John, that they're preaching and doing and acting like? Or does it look like one of these people who's possessed with the devil? Look at verse number 38 of Luke chapter 9. Luke 9, 38, And behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is mine only child. And lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly crieth out. But all of a sudden, right? He's sitting there. All of a sudden, he cries out. Isn't that the way that it works in these churches? That people will be sitting, you know, there's a service going on, and all of a sudden, someone stands up or sitting in a seat and goes, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I said, I'm not good. I haven't been practicing my tongue speaking. <laughs> So I know it's not that good. It's not going to sound very intelligible, although probably about as much as theirs does. And, um, and a terrorism him, that, and it says, uh, verse 39, Lo, a spirit taketh him, he suddenly crieth out, and it terrorism him that he foameth again, and bruising him hardly departeth from him. So these are, he's literally like foaming at the mouth. I mean, he's crying out, and he's foaming at the mouth. Tell me that that doesn't happen. I mean, many of these people looks like they're having a seizure. Mm -hmm. And when someone's having a seizure, they're foaming at the mouth. Yeah, it does. And this is what happens in these Pentecostal churches. Where do you ever see this type of behavior being defined in Scripture other than an unclean spirit entering into them or a devil coming into them? I see it right here as a devil. Look at verse number 40. And I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. And Jesus answering said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring my, thy son hither. And as he was yet coming, the devil threw him down and tear him. So again, he's just throwing him down on the floor. Not his own power. The devil's like making him just fall down on the ground and tear him. So I imagine he's rolling around when, you know, when this is happening because he's, he's, he's tearing him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him. You know, there's something wrong with this child. That's why Jesus had to heal him. That's not right. That's not normal. And now look, these things weren't happening nonstop with these people when they're possessed by these devils. It was happening periodically, right? Or oft times. That's why in the other example, oft times it throws them in the water, oft times into the fire. But it's not just like, it's, it wasn't just a continual thing nonstop all the time. 
they would have these fits and these things would happen and, and it's happening today. It's happening in Pentecostal churches. Look at Mark chapter 5. Actually, you know what? Stay in, if you're still in Luke, stay in Luke. Luke 4. I'm going to read Mark 5 for you, verse 2. The Bible says, And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broke in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. So we see people here, um, again, you know, someone who has an unclean spirit, having supernatural strength, having a lot of strength. Now, I, don't, I haven't been in enough of these Pentecostal churches to see everything that they do, but that is another attribute of someone who's possessed with a devil, you know, having this type of strength and not being able to be restrained. Um, and some people will say, see, that's the power of God. Like, no, that's, a, that's a, a devil power right there. It's not the same as what happened with Samson. Uh, Luke chapter 4, look at verse number 33. The Bible says, And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried, with, cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who, who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and heard him not. Now, this is a very important point that I'm going to make and we need to understand is that when someone's possessed with the devil, they're not just always going to be saying vile things like, like in the movie Exorcist, right? Where you have that girl and she's just saying blasphemous things and, you know, vomiting and all these other things that are just extremely wicked and disgusting, right? They're saying, whoa, we know you. You're the Holy One of Israel. We know you, Jesus. And they're talking to him, just like, we know who you are. And they're subject to him. But they're not saying all manner of blasphemies. They're talking to him because they know him. Think about this, and I, and I forgot to put it in my notes. But in the book of Acts, there was, a, there was a woman that was prophesying before the apostles and saying that they were coming, like, you know, that they were, there was, there's nothing that she was saying was like untrue. But the apostle Paul, I believe, always got sick of it and just turned around and like, like rebuked the devil. And she was possessed by a devil and the devil departed. And she, you know, cause she was just going around saying, oh, these men are coming in the name of the Lord. You can have someone possessed with a devil saying things that sound spiritual, saying things that sound like they might fit in a church, right? Saying things like, Maybe praise Jesus or whatever, right? I mean, they could say things like that. Someone who's possessed with the devil, it doesn't just have to be vile things, but the fact of the matter is they're still possessed. And the fact of the matter is that person, you know, and then, and then the father got upset because she was a source of income for them because she prophesied and would say, you know, and people would go to her and he was, you know, whatever, charging people to get, you know, their, their uh, crystal ball readings or whatever, whatever she was doing with a familiar spirit or what, you know, what, what have you, right? But she was possessed and that, that devil was cast out. But the things that she was saying, um, you, know, you know, if someone could find that reference for me, I, I totally meant to put that in my notes and I don't think I have it. Um, it's in the book of Acts and it's going to be earlier on, probably around, I'm thinking like chapter eight or nine. I, I've got a bunch to go through. So if you could find that and let me know later on, I'd appreciate it because I, I really want to want to hit that story. Um, it might even be a little bit earlier than I'm not, I'm not positive. In any case, we saw in Luke 4, right, the, the, the devils knew Jesus. And they're like, we know who you are. Are you come here to judge us before the time? You know, like, you're the, you're the Holy One of God. Nothing wicked or blasphemous coming out of their mouth, yet they're still possessing a man that, you know, with an unclean, as an unclean spirit. So, it's not far-fetched to think that people can be possessed in a church and, you know, saying all kinds of weird, random things, but then also saying things that might sound like it's glorifying to God. Right. Acts 16. Right. Turn, if you would, to Acts 16. Thanks for finding that for me. I thought it was a little bit earlier, but... Yep, yep, the girl. There it is, yeah, 1616. Exactly. 
That's exactly it. Acts, Acts 16, 16. The Bible says, And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us. Right? So she's possessed. Is, is there any question here? She's, she's possessed. She's possessed with a spirit of divination. Now, when you read in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, people who would divine and diviners and people that would seek familiar spirits, was that a good thing or a bad thing according to God's law? That was a bad thing. They're not supposed to be doing that, right? When Saul brought up Samuel from the witch, he wasn't supposed to be doing that. It was wicked. I mean, witch is supposed to be put to death, right? So here's someone who's, uh, who has a spirit of divination. She's possessed with a spirit of divination. Not a good thing. Met us, which brought her masters much gain by a soothsaying. In case you had any question about that spirit of divination, yeah, a soothsayer, not good in the Bible. You could find that in the Old Testament. Just look up the law. And you'll see that that soothsaying is not a good thing. It's, a, it's against God. It's wicked. But she brought a lot of gain, meaning a lot of money, by doing that, by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men, look at this. What's wrong about this statement? These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. This is what she was saying. She's proclaiming, Hey, these guys are men of God, and they're showing the way of salvation. Perfect example. There's nothing wrong with that statement. Yet was that, that girl was possessed. She was possessed with a spirit. Look at what and it says in verse 18. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. She was possessed. And, and the apostle Paul cast that spirit out. Because it's not of God to be possessed with a spirit. We are to be in control and in possessing our own spirit and trying the spirit. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now, what this girl happened to be saying at that time was true but you need to try the spirits. That spirit is not of God. That be, soothsaying is not of God. Being possessed with a spirit that controls you is not of God. God didn't make us to be controlled. He didn't make us to be robots. He gave us free will and he wants us to be in charge and to make decisions. Not to be just controlled and manipulated through, through a supernatural force. He's given us the Holy Spirit that is a spirit of God. But all throughout the Bible, you're going to see it tells you to walk in the spirit. You have the choice. God doesn't ever force you to be walking in the spirit. He says, walk in the spirit and you shall not obey the lust of the flesh. We need to be doing, you know, if we want to do what's right, we ought to be choosing to walk in the new man, dying to the old man and walking in a new man, walking in the spirit, doing what's right. It's always our choice. God never forces us to do one or the other. This spirit of divination was possessing. I mean, since she was possessed, it means being controlled by. That's what possession is, taking possession of something. I'm taking ownership of this. I'm taking possession of it. I'm using this. I'm in charge. That is not of God when you're possessed of any spirit. When God's spirit is working, people are filled with the spirit. People can do things under the power of the Holy Spirit, but they are not possessed of the spirit. It's not, it's not something that they're just, they're just completely controlled by. Turn, if you would, to uh, 1 Kings chapter 22. Because we need to try the spirits. Obviously, the apostle Paul, he got grieved with that woman who was possessed of the spirit with a spirit of divination. And he cast out the spirit. Under the authority of Jesus Christ, and the spirit was cast out. It was not a good spirit. It said things that were good, but it doesn't mean that it's, you know, like, like that, whatever that statement was, it doesn't mean she wasn't possessed and it doesn't mean that that's of God. The devils gave glory to Jesus Christ because he was Jesus Christ and they knew who he was. But it doesn't mean that the devils are good. 
First Kings 22, verse number 20, the Bible says, And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets. And the Lord had spoken evil concerning thee. This is a really interesting story. Because God's in heaven talking about, you know, how are we going to do this? Not that God needs anyone to give him an answer, but I mean, this is a story that's recorded. It's true. This is what happened. God's in heaven. And who's going to persuade Ahab because he wants Ahab to be destroyed? It's God's will that Ahab is destroyed. He was a wicked man. He was going to get judged. So he's saying, how can we trick Ahab into going up into this battle where he can be defeated and lose? And the spirit says, you know what? I'll go be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. And he'll listen to the prophets and, and think that it's coming from God. And it's not because I'm a lying spirit and I'm just going to say lies. And if you think that's not happening today, then you have no clue what's going on because it's happening all the time today. There's people who are listening and they call themselves Christians. They look like ministers of light and they're really doing the work of the devil. They're lying. They're, they don't have the truth. And there are, there are prophets today and that's why the Bible says to try the spirits because there's many false prophets. So when you try or test the spirits, that's how you know if someone's false or true. And what the Pentecostal churches are filled with these days are false spirits, lying spirits, false prophets, lying people and deceiving them about being saved and telling you you have to have you speak in tongues to prove that you're saved or you could lose your salvation if you start backsliding. That's a damnable doctrine that is a false gospel that teaches you you have to do good works in order to stay saved. And that's straight out of the pit of hell. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We're going to spend a lot of time in 1 Corinthians 14. It's, the, it's probably the most comprehensive chapter in the whole Bible regarding what it means to speak with other tongues. I'm going to read for you from 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 9, because this is an example of what a spirit-filled man does, a spirit filled from God, God's spirit. He prophesies that all can understand. 1 Samuel 10, 9 says, And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, this is talking about Saul, God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. And when he came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. He's preaching. He's preaching the Word of God. The Spirit of God came upon him. He had boldness, and he began to preach. When the Spirit of God became, came upon the men in Acts chapter 2, they were filled with the Spirit, they got boldness, and they preached the Word of God. And guess what? People could understand them. The people they were talking to all could understand what they were saying without an interpreter. They didn't even need an interpreter. Yet they were speaking other tongues or languages. And we'll, if we have time, I'm going to get into Acts chapter 2. But I really want to go pretty much verse, through, verse by verse through 1 Corinthians 14 just to prove to you. I mean, we've seen plenty of examples of what people look like when... They're possessed by a devil. What things can happen? The devil can say things that might sound honoring to Jesus Christ, but when it throws them on the ground and people are foaming at the mouth and rolling around, that's not of God. That's something a possessed person does. It's all the attributes right there from Scripture. Show me anything else that happens in these Pentecostal churches and show me where that happens by a spirit-filled man of God. You're not going to find one. Yet supposedly that's the way things are supposed to be and that's the way they were back in the book of Acts. No, it's not. Uh, no, it's not because what language are you speaking? In Acts chapter 2, it lists off all the languages that they spake to the people there because the people were coming from different countries and they had different native tongues, native languages that they spake. And they understood everything that the apostles were speaking even though they had no knowledge of the language themselves. 1 Corinthians 14, though, spells this out very clearly. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. Now, the gift of being able to speak in another language that you don't know is a spiritual gift, is it not? That's a gift that was given by God to certain people. Did everybody have that gift? 
No. Those spiritual gifts were given to different people as God will. As, the, the way that God wanted people to have those gifts, he gave those gifts out. Was everybody able to heal? No. Was everybody able to speak with other tongues? No. Were some people able to do both? Yeah. Some people had a lot of gifts. Some people maybe have only had one. Some people didn't have any of those particular spiritual gifts. It doesn't make any of them unsaved, but it's the way that God divvied up the spiritual gifts. So anyhow, being able to speak with a language you don't know to get someone to understand you is a spiritual gift. So the Bible says, follow after chari charity and desire spiritual gifts. There's nothing wrong with wanting to do that. There's nothing wrong with desiring for God to bless you with the gift to be able to reach an entire people and you can't speak their language for God to be able to, there's nothing wrong with that. That's great. Hey, I think it would be cool to, to go to another country and I don't know the language and God could just use me and they could understand me. Great. They bring honor to God. I don't know that language. It's not my own smarts that did it. God gave me that ability and it's awesome and, and people are getting saved because they could understand me. It's a good thing. But look at this. It says, follow up the chair and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. He's saying more important than, you know, desiring spiritual gifts, how about preaching? Because that's what prophesying is. It's preaching God's word. Verse two, for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now, that word unknown is people will take this and run with it. Because what they'll say is that, oh, this is an angelic language. This is a language that nobody else knows in the whole world and that this is an... Uh, now, does that say angelic tongue? No, it says unknown. If someone came in here and spake Chinese tonight, does anyone know Chinese? No. You know Mandarin? No, I don't either. You know what? That's an unknown tongue in this church. If someone came in here and started speaking... Or, or how about Hebrew? Anyone know Hebrew? No. It's an unknown tongue. Does that mean no one in the whole world knows that language? No, but in this church. And what's 1 Corinthians 14 talking about? It's talking about things being done in the church, and we'll get to that in a little bit. We'll see that. It's be, it'll be more clear and more evident that that's what he's talking about. But he says, if anyone speaks in an unknown tongue, they speaketh not unto men. Why are you not speaking to men? Because they can't understand you. So why would you speak unto men? And why, why would he, you know, Brother Sebastian speaks Polish. No one else in this room knows Polish. Why would he speak Polish to anybody here? What would be the purpose of that? It wouldn't matter. It wouldn't make any sense, right? He could speak all day long and we'd be like, yeah, okay, whatever. I don't know. I don't know what you're saying. doesn't profit anybody. Now he could speak to God. If he wanted to pray to God, can he speak in Polish and pray to God? Of course. God knows all languages. He can communicate just fine with God, but not with anyone else because it's an unknown tongue. That's what this is talking about. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth that, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. He could be saying, he, Brother Spencer could preach the most awesome sermon in Polish for us and speak mysteries and just, uh, just really unravel the word of God and just, just make everything clear. And you know what? It'll do nothing. For us because we won't understand a word of what he's saying but in the spirit he could be speaking mysteries verse 3 but he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort so he's what he's doing he's contrasting being able to speak with in another language that nobody knows with being able to preach God's word in the language that everybody knows so he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification. What? You build people up. Hey, when you're preaching, when you're prophesying, what are you doing? You're building people up. You're strengthening people, right? You're strengthening them through the word of God. You're exhorting them. Hey, man, we should be going out and doing this work and get everyone excited and riled up and getting ready to do the work of God and comforting. Man, I'm going through some hard times. Oh, you know, word of God says this and this and you preach these things. Comfort to people. Hey, there's a lot of value. There's a lot of benefit to that. Way more than just standing up here and speaking in some language that no one could understand. One has value, the other one has, has no value except maybe to just praying to God. 
It doesn't matter how deep or awesome the, the mysteries could be that you're unraveling in an unknown tongue. Elizabeth, don't you do that. You sit still. Verse number five. Oh, excuse me. Verse number four. I skipped verse number four. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Right? So if Brother Benjamin was preaching in, in Polish, he would understand what he's saying. He could be edified by himself, right? Like through the word of God and the preaching because he knows what he's saying. But no one else is going to be edified. It would just be him. He's the only one who understands it. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Right? So, so the preaching, like the preaching is going on right now. Hey, the whole church could be edified by this because everybody understands the language. Verse number five, I would that ye all spake with tongues. And you know what? I wish you could all do that. That'd be great, right? Just like desire spiritual gifts. It's a good thing. That'd be cool. That'd be great if we could all just communicate with everyone in the whole world, anyone you ever ran across, because you have the gift of being able to speak in their tongue. That would be cool. And Apostle Paul was all for it. I'm all for it. Great. I think that'd be good. He says, but rather that you prophesied. If I had a choice between you being able to speak with some other language and you being able to just come up and preach the word of God, I'd rather you be able to preach. I'd rather you could just prophesy. He says, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. He's saying it's, it's way better. To, I mean, and it's obvious, right? I mean, this is so stupid simple. It, it, it boggles my mind and it even needs to be explained sometimes but these people just, just turn the scripture on its head. So if Brother Sebastian were to come up and preach in Polish and then he interpreted everything he said to us, then we could receive some benefit from that. Oh, that's what you said? Okay, cool. Yeah, it's great, right? We could understand. We could learn something. We, we, could, we could grow by that. We could be edified. Verse number six, now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, and a tongue is just a language, it's very clear from the Bible, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? He's saying even things that aren't alive. Inanimate objects, instruments. It could be a guitar, it could be a, a trumpet, it could be, you know, whatever. Unless there's a certain distinction between the sounds. If you just went, I mean, imagine a trumpet is going, and there's no distinction in any sounds. There's no meaning to that. Now, it's a little bit, um, it's not really part of our society, our culture, that much, but it's not that hard to understand. People know what like um, um, doo, 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 you know, you hear these tunes, mm -hmm. or what's it? Taps, right? Mm -hmm. Usually, when someone dies, they'll play that. Like, like you could hear that tune, and you understand. Oh, I know what that means. Or you could, you know, like a charge type of a sound. You know, people. Th th these historically sounds have been used by instruments to give people a signal to let them know what to do or what it means. And that's what this is saying right here. He's saying, you know, even these things without life, if you're using this, you have to have a distinction in the sounds in order to give people a meaning, in order to understand anything about it at all. If there's no distinction in the sounds, it's useless. It says, verse eight, for if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, people are just like, what, was that a trumpet? What was that? What, what was that noise? I don't even know what that was. Who shall prepare himself to the battle? Why? Because they had a special sound that was played for people to get ready because, hey, the enemy's here. We need to get ready to fight. Get ready. Get on the front lines and go. And they had a, a signal for that with a trumpet. But if you don't give the right sound, no one knows that. Verse 9, so likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. What he's saying is, if I don't know what's being said, I don't understand the meaning because I don't know the language and no one's interpreting for me, you're like a barbarian. I mean, you're like, you're like a caveman. Right? Ooh, ooh. You know, not that caveman's even ever existed, I believe, but you know, there, there are people that lived in caves, I'm sure, but not the way that, that the world's going to teach it to you, like some Neanderthal or whatever. 
But the way that, that you would imagine a Neanderthal man, if they really existed, would communicate would be a barbarian to you. You have no idea what they're saying. You have no clue. Verse number 12, even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel the edifying of the church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. So it was possible for people to have the gift of speaking in an unknown tongue and not being able to interpret that language. So he's saying, if you're going to be able to speak in an unknown tongue, I want you to be able to know what you're saying too, to be able to interpret it and let other people know what's going on. He says in verse 14, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Now, there is a benefit or fruitfulness to people praying to God. Verse 15, What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Now, these two verses here destroy this idea of this heavenly prayer language myth. I've heard this before, too. So I've run into people who say, you know, because that, as we get into this chapter, you're going to see how everything needs to be decently and in order in the church. And these, these charismatic churches that believe in this tongue speaking thing, everybody's just, just yelling out and laying on the ground. It's chaos and it's not orderly. And it's so easy to show how wrong that is from Scripture and how unbiblical it is. But then some people will go to church because some churches will, will have thought about that and say, yeah, you know what, we shouldn't do that. But they still believe in this gibberish talk and this nonsense and this demon possession of just speaking in random unknown languages that nobody knows. And they still try to justify it and fit it in to, to make this work. And I've had people say, oh, yeah, yeah, we don't do that. You need to be two or three and have an interpreter. Someone has to be able to interpret because we'll get to that in a little bit. But they'll say, but when I go home, then I pray to God in an unknown, t in, in the angelic language. Well, the Apostle Paul didn't do that. And he didn't practice that. And he didn't suggest anyone to do that. That is not something that the Bible tells you to do. Why would anyone want to even do that? Because the Bible says here, if I pray in an unknown tongue, hey, yeah, your spirit may pray. If you pray in a foreign language that you don't know, your spirit can still be praying to God. God can understand it and hear it. But it says, but my understanding is unfruitful. He said, you know, the Apostle Paul had the gift of being able to speak in other tongues. He had that gift, that spiritual gift of being able to communicate with other people in a language that he didn't know. And if he started praying to God in some language he didn't know, he says, my understanding is unfruitful. Yeah, my spirit's still praying to God and God understands me, but I don't even know what I'm saying. So I'm not going to do that. That's why he says, what is it then? Well, what am I going to do? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. So how would he pray with the spirit and the understanding in his own language that he knew? That's how he would pray with the understanding. He said, I am praying with you. Because you don't have to, it's not like the only way you could pray in the spirit is through an unknown language. You could be praying in the spirit with your own language. And he said, I am going to pray in the spirit and I'm going to pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. He says, the most benefit is by just using the language that everybody knows. If you're in a place where everyone knows a different language and you could use that gift to speak to them, then that's the most beneficial language. Otherwise, you speak with the language that you know. And even if it's just you by yourself at home, it is totally worthless for you to be praying in some spirit language that you, so, that you think believe, that exists out there, some, some angelic language. That's not what the Bible teaches at all to do that. Verse number 16, Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing understandeth not what thou sayest? I mean, this only makes sense. We, we went out to eat this afternoon and we asked for a blessing upon the food. We asked for a blessing from God. We gave thanks for what we had, right? And everybody wasn't all saying their own prayers. We had one person say the prayer. And what happened? Other people said Amen. Why? Because they agreed with that. They're praying the same thing because they can understand everything that's being said. What if I made that prayer in Spanish and you don't know Spanish and, you know, and everyone's just like, I mean, you can't say amen to that. You have no idea what was said. You hope that maybe I was you know, asking for a blessing or giving thanks, but you wouldn't know. And, and you know, 
I, don't, I really don't want to beat this too hard, but it, it just seems so obvious, and I don't understand why people get this, but um, remember 1 Corinthians 14, anytime you run into someone that might actually be willing to listen and to show them how screwed up that, that, uh, that heavenly language thing is. Um, let's keep reading here, though. Verse number 17, for thou verily, verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, and look at this, this is specifically talking about in the church. Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So I could be preaching and preaching and preaching and 10,000 words in some unknown tongue. It's like, I'd rather just say five in a, in a, in a tongue that everybody can understand. Yet, what's the emphasis in these charismatic churches? Oh, speaking in tongues. Oh, man, you're filled with the Spirit. Oh, hey, look at this person speaking in tongues. And put the, put the glory on them and the emphasis on them and the whole thing about this, this circus around people speaking in tongues when that is not biblical at all or scriptural at all. And that's not the way things were done in the early church. That's not the way God moved or used anybody. It wasn't the way that they're doing things today. Look at verse number 20. And, and you know what? This whole concept goes to the heart of Christianity. Because what is he concerned about when he's talking about spiritual gifts? The concern is always other people. Edifying others. Benefiting other people. It's not about you and, and you being so spiritual and holy and you speaking to God. It's what does everyone understand? How are you helping them? How do you help anyone else by speaking a language that nobody knows? You're not. Verse number 20, brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but understanding be men. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe. And get this, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. What's church designed for? The believer or the unbeliever? Is, did God design church for the world? Is that what church is for? Hey, every unsaved person, God made a place for you and it's called church. No. The church is for believers. The church is to come in and sing praises unto the God that you believe in, together with other people who believe like you believe and to do the work that God has for you to do and for you to learn from God's word. That's why there's a church. That's why God has given apostles and teachers and preachers and, 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 and all these different people with gifts to be able to help you believers. So, if tongues are for a sign to them that don't believe and church is for believers, is church the place for tongues? No, not at all. They're for a sign. And the whole point of this was so that the people can, one, fulfill the prophecy that he says here in verse 21, it's in the law, that with men, this is what God's word said, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that, they will not hear me, saith the Lord. God prophesied that in the Old Testament and it came to pass in, in the book of Acts when there were men with other tongues that prophesied unto the people and they still rejected it. Even though they marveled that it's this miracle, how can all these men which are of Galilee speak and we can understand them in our own, in our own tongue in the nation where we were born? It's a miracle. They weren't believers and they hear this. They're like, wow, that's crazy. I can't believe these people are speaking. Yet they still don't believe. God fulfilled that prophecy. It had to be fulfilled. That's why, that's why these tongues were, were done. To reach people and that, these, that this scripture can be fulfilled. Because it's the word of God and it has to come to pass. But the prophesying serveth not for them that believe not. So the preaching, again, the tongues are for people who don't believe just so you could see a sign. Right? And maybe that makes an impact with them. But preaching, prophesying is for those that do believe. That's why we don't go out, when we go out door-to-door -door preaching the gospel, we don't go out preaching, you know, how men and women should act and dress and, and what the Bible says about just different doctrines and all kinds of things that you would hear in church. 
because that's no use to someone who's not regenerated. It's not going to help them. It's not for them. They, they, that's why the Bible says Jesus spake unto the, the multitudes in parables. But he explained everything to his disciples. Why? Because the multitudes weren't saved. He preached unto them, you know, darkly and in parables, but he's like, it's not for them to know this. It is for you, though. You're believers. You're disciples. I'll open up all the scriptures to you. But it wasn't for them. Now, Jesus preached the gospel. That was for them. He wanted people to get saved. But he wasn't just all of his doctrinal sermons. and thus He wasn't, he wasn't preaching all that to the multitudes. He taught his disciples and he opened up their understanding. Verse number 23. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? I wish these Pentecostal churches would, you know, these people that go there would actually read their Bibles. If the whole church has come together, we're congregated in one place, and everybody's just speaking with these tongues, which, look, I've seen so many videos of this stuff on YouTube. Don't tell me this doesn't happen in these charismatic churches. I know it happens. There's people falling on the ground and speaking, you know, over here and over there. Look, Anyone that walks into that is going to say, you guys are nuts. That's what it means by mad. It doesn't mean angry. It means you're nuts. Aren't they going to think that you guys are crazy? And yeah, they will. I would. You guys are nuts, man. What in the world are you doing? Verse 24, but if all prophesy, but if you're actually preaching and people can understand you and there's someone up there just preaching from the word of God, and there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned. He is convinced of all. He is judged of all. They can actually understand what you're saying then. And it makes sense because they're hearing what you're saying from God's word. And it's not just a bunch of people just spouting off stuff. And it's like, what are you guys saying? What are you, I can't, I have no clue what's going on here. This is nuts. I'm out of here. Verse 25. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. You want to reach those unbelievers that come into your church? That's how you do it. You can do it through the preaching, not through speaking with other languages and other tongues. Speaking with other tongues has no place in church. It doesn't belong there. They're for signs for those that don't believe. Church is, for not, is not for unbelievers, it's for believers. That's why Jesus always said, go out. Go out into the highways and hedges. Go out and preach the gospel of every creature. Go out and do this. You know, how, how beautiful are the feet of them that are shod with the gospel of peace. You know, go to, to preach the, 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 the preparation of the gospel of peace. peace. Why? The feet. Because they're going out. Because you're reaching the lost where they are. Because you're going to become all things to all men, but you might by all means save some. And then we bring them in. Verse 26, how is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you at the psalm, at the doctrine, at the tongue, hath the revelation, hath an interpretation, let all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three and that by course and let one interpret. He said, if you are going to have anybody that speaks a language that nobody knows, this is how you do it. You, do, you, have, you have two or three. He says, at the most by three. Not everybody who just pipes up in the congregation and just starts jibber-jabbering and babbling. No, if you have someone, and, and you know what this also says? In order to have this type of methodology, two or three, and that by course, and let one interpret, it means that whoever's going to speak in that unknown tongue has control of when they're going to speak. Because if you just had no control, how could you make sure there's only two or at the most by three speaking? Because everyone would just be spouting off. And then again, how could that be the Holy Spirit? If they're just forcing you to speak out in contradiction to what the scripture says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. That's not God contradicting his own word and saying, well, I'm going to give this person my spirit and I'm going to make them just cry out and they have no choice and they're going to cry out and he's going to cry out and she's going to cry out and he's going to cry out and all these people are just going to cry out 
all at the same time when I said no, that's not the way I want things done at all. These Pentecostal churches are of the devil. They preach a false gospel that says you can lose your salvation, which is, which is ultimately a works-based salvation, and they have the spirit of Satan because they're possessed by devils when they roll around on the floor, and they're possessed of devils when they speak in these, this jibber-jabberish language. Verse number 28, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God, right? Again, demonstrating if the person has the ability to keep silent, then it's not something that's possessing them and controlling them to do these things. They have control. The Bible says in verse 29, let the prophets speak two or three and let the other judge if anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. Look at the control demonstrated here. Okay, I'm going to be quiet now. You could speak. Oh, I got a revelation. Oh, I want something I want to say. I'm going to wait my turn. I'm going to do things decently and in order. And then I'm going to speak. And then another person could speak when they're done. This is the way things are ought to be done in church. And more importantly, it can be done because in these Pentecostal churches, Supposedly, they can't help it. The Spirit just comes over them and they just start talking. That's not a Spirit of God. Amen. Verse 30, If anything be revealed to another that by, let the first hold his peace, for ye may all prophesy one by one that, ye, that all may learn and all may be comforted. And, the, and this, is the, this is the key verse here. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. The Spirit that you get that's from God the prophet, the person preaching, the person who's, who's speaking is in control because the spirit is subject to you because you're in control. The spirit is not controlling you. You possess the spirit. The spirit doesn't possess you. If it's the spirit of the prophets being subject underneath the prophet. Verse number 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. It's confusion when you have a bunch of people speak. If we just had everyone, even just, just in languages, we all understood. If everyone was speaking English today, but everyone just stood up and started saying their own thing, well, God showed me this and God showed me that, that's confusion. Because you can't listen to anybody when everybody's speaking. It's nonsense. And that's utterly what it is, is nonsense. And they turn church into a circus and a free-for-all. Verse number 34, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. I don't know. I, I'd be, you'd be hard-pressed, I think, to find a, a Pentecostal church that, that follows that commandment, let alone everything else. Oh, yes, sister, she's filled with the Spirit. Listen to her speak in tongues. Uh, yeah, you're not even supposed to be doing that at all, ever. And I don't care what language it is. Let your women keep silence in the churches. Now, now how could you even twist this passage? I don't even see how anyone could twist this passage. It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted. Per you don't have permission. Can I speak in it? No. It's not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything... Let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So it says, well, what do you mean when it says they'll learn anything? Because during the preaching time, it's a time of teaching. And you know what? From time to time, we'll have a man in the church that wants to, that wants to ask a question or bring up a point or say something during the sermon. And you know what? That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's not for women to be doing that. Because the Bible says that the women are supposed to, if you, wanna, if you, wanna, if you don't understand something, you don't just start asking the question in the middle of service. You wait and go home and ask your husband. And he'll tell you. Why? Because it's a shame for women to speak in the church. Verse 36, what came the word of God out from you or came it unto you only? Now, and look, just reading verses 34 and 35 will make, drive people up the wall and make them so angry. How dare you say that women can't speak? Who do you think you are, you misogynist and you chauvinist and you, you know, all this stuff? You hate women, you degrade women, all this other stuff. Well, look, do you think that you're a spiritual person? 
Do you think that you love God? Oh, oh you know, you that has that attitude over just reading verses 34 and 35. Verse 37 says, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. You think you're spiritual? You think you're godly? You think you believe in Jesus Christ? You believe in God of the Bible? Then you better be ready to acknowledge that verses 34 and 35 are the commandments of the Lord. That's not the Apostle Paul. That's not their culture. That's not just the way that they did things back then. That's the commandments of the Lord. Amen. There's no excuse that you might want to try to put into that passage to, to just write it off and say why that doesn't mean what it means today. No, it does mean what it means today because those are the commandments of the Lord. God said, this is the way things are to be done in the church and women are to keep silence. Verse 38, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. I don't forbid people to speak another language because that's what a tongue is, is a language. But as this chapter, as this whole chapter, you, know, you can't just go to the very end and say, see, it says forbid not to speak with tongues without reading the whole rest of the chapter before that. Because wouldn't it be appropriate to say, well, we are going to forbid people from speaking in an unknown tongue that nobody understands. That is forbidden. In the context of that very chapter, that is forbidden. That is something that's not to be done in church. And it's not to be done when you got a whole bunch of people just shout, spouting off the mouth. You're saying, if someone has an unknown tongue, then there has to be an interpreter. So it's forbidden to speak in a language that no one knows unless someone's able to give us the meaning of it and interpret it. That's forbidden. But you know what? If we've got a brother in Christ that doesn't speak English, I'm not going to forbid him to speak in tongues as long as someone can tell us what he's saying mm -hmm. and that we could all be edified by it. I'm not going to forbid that. It's such a simple doctrine. I mean, the, you have to just twist Scripture to try to get it to mean anything other than what it says. You have to. And a lot of people get deceived thinking it's the power of God because people are acting out of control and rolling around and doing all this weird stuff and, and, and using language that, you know, they try to make it sound like Latin. And, so, you know, and some of these people have been doing it for a long time. I saw a documentary recently, or part of one, of um, is this, is this uh, charismatic Pentecostal preacher. And I, I, man, I forget his name. But it was uh, this, this, basically he was a kid and his parents brought him up like in this, in this charismatic church, a Pentecostal church, and they trained him from a really young age. Like he was like, the, like this youngest preacher, you know, he was like five years old, and they would get him to, to, to just preach this stuff. And what he said was that, you know, they would bring him up there and people would think, wow, what an amazing, you know, power of God that he can say all these things and preach all these things and he's only five years old. But what they didn't know is that he was being taught and trained like rigorously, like every single day at home by his parents. And like they were just really hard on driving this into him that he was going to be this type of preacher and he was going to do these things and he had to learn the lingo and he had to get everything down. And this is what he focused on all the time. So that he can be brought into different churches. Why? Because you know what? In the Pentecostal church, what they do then is they pass around these plates and then they'd get the, all this money. And he was demonstrating because he knew it was all just a racket from the beginning. He knew it was all a fraud. But he was brought up in this. And he was demonstrating how to speak with tongues. How to speak in tongues. Because it was all phony and he knew it was phony, yet he deceived hundreds, if not, you know, probably thousands. I don't know that much about the person, but I saw part of the documentary they were filming this stuff. And he's even saying it's nonsense. And he was like one of these, one of these big names in the movement. False prophet, false teacher, preaching for money. That's all, all he cared about was this gig of just doing money, of just get, making money. He allowed these documentary filmmakers to do, to film what he was doing and you know what? I don't even know what his motivation was because he was still doing the speaking and deceiving people. And he had to like, he had to tell the people that they would go into these church events and stuff and these big tent events that they would have. And he would have to tell them, 
that these people that were with him were filming like a Christian documentary. So like these guys were real worldly. They, they weren't Christians or anything like that. You know, they were, and this was like in the seventies or something. These were kind of like these hippie guys and they were smoking and other things. And he's like, no, no, no. He's like, he's like, we need, you know, if we're going to pull this off, you can't be smoking. You can't be, you know, talking to these girls and stuff because he's trying to play them off as being like these real spiritual guys that are part of the, the Pentecostal church that were filming it for, you know, for the glory of God, right? When they were really exposing the fraud behind everything that went down. And I mean, they were showing this guy like after one of these events and he's, he's just, they're literally just divvying up this money between the preacher of the, like the church and this guy who came in to do the speaking from all the money they collect and they're just, they're just counting their money, you know, and this is your cut and this is my cut and like, it's all just cash. It's just a racket and it's false and people buy into the lies because, hey, you pra if, if you practice it long enough, you could, you could start saying words that sound like another language and you could call it a heavenly language and guess what? No one's going to know what you're saying and you can just use it. Well, it's an unknown tongue and I'm filled with the spirit, right? And it's, total, it's a total lie. And that's what's going on in these places, either one, by the deception, or two, because they're being possessed by, by an evil, wicked spirit that's not of God. So these Pentecostal churches, you know, don't, don't buy into their stuff. They're of the devil. And that is evidenced through the possess demon possession that's going on when they claim to be speaking with, with other tongues, you know, that they say is the Holy Spirit. Let's bow our eyes and a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your clear instruction from the Bible. God, I pray that you please help us to be in obedience and, and, and I pray that you would correct us in, in any error that we have in the way that we worship you and the way that we study in, the, in our doctrine and the things that we understand about you, dear Lord. We're just interested in the truth. God, I pray that you please help us to be strong against those who are spreading lies and especially those who are spreading false gospels. Lord, I pray that you please help us to reach the people that have been deceived that, um, the, the, but they want to know the truth. Help us to reach them and, and show them how they could be saved and, and how they could receive eternal life, which lasts forever, dear Lord, and they can never lose that um, just by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. Help us to reach those people, God. Help us to become better soul winners and, and teach us and instruct us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.